Hi again, welcome to Blocksiders. My name is Luke, and today I'm going to be speaking with Charles Reed. Charlie is a personal friend that I met back in 2017-18 during the crazy crypto period of the time. He was a researcher at one of the largest uh, crypto reports that existed out of Dubai, and has since gone on to form his own prestigious private investor network. Uh, he's raised probably a couple of hundred million dollars uh, over the years, all over the past few years for pretty large blockchain projects. Um, he currently does market, market advisory, digital marketing and growth hacking for blockchain and emerging, emerging technology startups. Uh, he also does a bit of freelance journalism. Um, I think he's getting into the like academic space when it comes to researching in the blockchain. Uh, he also is a partner at the Launch Team or at Launch Team, which is a company designed to help launch um, books, products and entire companies. Uh, he also is the head of growth at Zumo, which is a non-custodial wallet. Um, we talk about a little bit about that in the interview. Anyway, I'm going to cut this one up into a few different pieces. Right now, you're going to see the whole interview. Uh, it's fairly long, so I'm actually going to try to make it into a few smaller pieces so it's a bit more digestible. I'll put the links up here in a few uh, after they've been released, so probably in a few days. Um, but they'll be available slowly over the next few days. But if you're happy to sit through about an hour and... 10 odd minutes of content, um, then please sit back and enjoy. Thanks so much. Yeah, just Charlie, I mean, um, why don't you just up, update me on what you've been working on and we'll go from there. Sure, man. So um, I aligned probably this time last year. I was at Consensus New York and I met a really cool team called Zumo and they're building a crypto wallet that supports fiat. Now, I'm really bullish on the wallet space in general, especially very user friendly wallets because obviously they, you know, they provide the interface to Web3. Um, and there's not many good wallets. So ones that support fiat is really, really useful, especially fiat on ramps. Um, Zumo is also decentralized wallet, so you control your private keys. So at the moment, I am heading up growth for them. Mm -hmm. And then I'm still, I'm still working on my own, you know, consulting stuff, marketing um, with a company called Launch Team, and we launch. Um, books, products, companies. We help entrepreneurs build business infrastructure. Um, and yeah, just we basically launch stuff and, and help companies to grow. And how's that been going, the launch stuff side? Launch team's been going really well. Um, we, I mean, you know, I worked with some of these guys for a long time during the blockchain, you know, the bubble and um, for the past few years. Um, and we, we were operating under the name Block Team. And um, you know, we work with some of the top companies in the space, but traditionally, launch team. Uh, my partner Jesse, um, he he's uh, he's an author. He's a three-time best-selling author, and he's launched a lot of products and books. So we went to you know work with traditional tech companies as well. We've done a lot of stuff with VR, AR, metaverse. Um, so it's nice, you know, after being so kind of in the weeds of the blockchain mess that that you know uh, the bear market mess for so long it is nice to um to get out there and and do some you know other m tech projects but mm. um we're still very much doing blockchain we've had some really big clients come in uh should be announcing some soon um and really what we're doing is we're doing public relations so you know we help people get placed in forbes coin telegraph coin desk um entrepreneur magazine and then some of the tier two publications as well. And um, aside from that, email marketing campaigns, help them connect with you know content creators um, and just generally help them to understand how they could be utilizing their existing marketing functions a bit better. So th that's gone really well and I'm, I'm enjoying that. Um, it's nice to have a bit of diversity after just doing blockchain projects for you know the best part of probably three years now. No, so what? How have you? How have you seen the space change over the past um, over the past little while? Um, it's definitely matured. There's less capital going into ICOs, and um, we had obviously the ICO bubble. Then we had the IEO bubble, and now we're uh, you know we're not seeing IEOs raise much capital at all. I think you know uh, last month we saw less investment into token projects than we have uh, in the past two years. 
it was, you know, we're seeing the adoption metrics are down for Web3, for decentralized applications, less people are building dApps, and some really drastic changes need to be made to, you know, increase that, that um, you know, adoption curve again. So things have changed probably for the good, you know, we've, um, it's become harder to raise, which is always a good sign. But it's also difficult for good projects uh, who have good token economics to actually close capital. So we're seeing more equity being raised um, uh, and, you know, more companies are setting up a foundation, which they will raise capital for the foundation. And then it's like a nonprofit so they can, you know, fund the token operations that way, which is good. It's definitely matured. Um, but we're seeing, you know, as we as we knew we would, that the us are falling very very behind on mm. um or, or, you know in on tokens and blockchain in general um because they're just they're dismissive and they have you know very stringent regulations especially state to state they don't have um you know blanket laws they're all different in each state so it's making it very difficult but it's very good in europe europe's been great um there's a lot of amazing projects raising you know still some projects are raising a lot of money um from very smart vcs so yeah the, the space has changed it's evolved um it's continuing to evolve i think now we're going to see a DeFi bubble i think a lot of people are going to raise a lot of money off the back of the DeFi hype and it's just you know realizing that there are there is space for all of these things there are space for ios icos there are raising but you know it's important that people don't get too bullish on anything um and just remain able to kind of see past it because you know yeah. you're, you can get burned very easily but just just on DeFi, because i mean that is literally the flavor of the month at the moment yeah. um i mean what's um what how do you see that um how do you see that um that playing out the the DeFi bubble how do you see that sort of um going is it because you think that there's going to be projects that maybe have not much you know that, that it's going to be like 2017 and, and the subsequent io bubble where you basically have just crappy projects that have no idea what they're doing but they just you know they talk a good story um or is it more that there's i mean like i mean like you know this is the things that are in my head the reasons what it could be or is it there's going to be um too many chefs too small a kitchen like as in there's too many projects that will really be able to capitalize on the amount of available customers sure i think i don't think we're going to see it like we did in the ico bubble it will never be that big but what we'll see is there's this you know pattern of behaviors which i'm seeing again which is like you'll see people on 4chan and you'll see people on reddit shilling uh, you know a tiny small cap DeFi project that's only on Uniswap and it has like a 200k market cap and then it will do a 10x in a week because the FOMO is there again and I think it's easier to get that FOMO in place for the flavor of the month which just happens yeah. to be DeFi right now so um so yeah it's you know I think that's what we're going to see because it's so easy to list tokens on these decentralized protocols like Uniswap. And I mean, now there's aggregators for liquidity, which are very smart. It's just becoming an easier way to raise capital, to launch a token and then to basically, you know, create some FOMO on, you know, Reddit and 4chan. And then you get this, you know, this FOMO pump and you, you've essentially then you're able to dump your token at a premium. So I think yeah. we'll see that from some good teams as well, you know, but um, that's that's where I see a lot of interest is coming in. And there's some good big DeFi projects that will, will come out soon. So, you know, I'm bullish for that space in general, um, but I just think that because it's the next, you know, the next big thing that it's going to be easy to get too excited about it. Yeah, I think that I mean I think that one of the uh, like you said uh, my my view on the on the DeFi space is like any mini bubble that's existed in this in this space so far is um, is that you've got just this oh basically like it's the new thing then there's this overwhelming amount of projects who all try to basically pile in on the space and and for me it's like there's only so many in an early adopters market or even a like extremely cutting edge early adopters kind of you know market there's only a limited number of customers that will that you'll be able to grab 
and then be able to show to investors that, hey, we've got this many customers, we've got this many users, we've got this this good story, um, you know, that can be shared around. Like, so, I mean, if there's only an available market of, say, 10,000 people, absolutely, then a couple of the big projects are going to get the first 8,000 and then the other 2,000 will be split between the bottom 95%, which means they're all fail. Yeah, um, exactly. They're not going to have traction, they're not going to have, you know, a positive user story, they're not going to have anything like that. So, um I mean, that that would be my just, you know, as someone who probably still haven't done much work in the DeFi space, despite the fact that my, my background is finance. But, um, yeah, I mean, that would be my sort of, you know, backseat driver sort of view of, of, of what, what's going to happen to the space. Absolutely. And at the moment, people are still building like layer one solutions for DeFi. They're all trying to build like the baseline protocols. But what we need to bring new users is layer two and layer three. We need actual decentralized applications that make DeFi easier for people. And until we have that, it's, um, you know, it, it, we're, we're still stuck with them same 10,000 first users, you know, and everyone's fighting for them. So this is why I'm bullish on wallets because wallets like Argent and Zumo that allow access to um, the benefits of DeFi very easily um, for, you know, first time users or second or third time users, they're going to be um, the key to getting new users in. Tell me about, um, about Consensus New York. Tell me what that's like. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> okay, so um, I think I went two years. I've been t I've been twice. Um, it's very fun. There's a lot of cool people there. There's also a lot of opportunists there. Um, consensus is generally one of the better conferences because it's in New York, and it, you know it's just a financial hub. There's some very smart people in New York. There's very good parties <laughs> in New York as well, which is always fun. But yeah, as always, there's lots of opportunists. But I've had more success at Consensus than any other conference. In oh, kind of just, just, just go into a bit more. What's a what's an opportunist? Um, people who you know show you the next big thing, try try to get you to buy their bags, um, tell you they've got the solution to X Y Z problem. Um, you know, we've got the next best blockchain. We're going to do 100x. There's a lot of people there who all have, who all think that they have, you know, got the best thing since sliced bread. And um, yeah, the, it it gets very noisy, and people are constantly selling to you, constantly shilling to you. Um, Especially if they know that you're an investor or you have access to investors. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Um, as soon as you mention you work with investors or, you know, you've invested previously, you just get hounded. And mm. I mean, I understand, you know, if you're raising money, you have to be on the front foot with that stuff. But it just gets very, very boring. So actually, you know, the first year I went, I tried to meet with as many people as I could spend as long as I could at the conference. The second time, no. Nope. Not unless I'm introduced by someone who I know is smart, who will not waste my time. Then I'll mm. take the meeting. But it's about knowing when to take the meeting and and <laughs> when not to. Because if you just walk around, you'll just get you'll just get pinned down all day by people trying to shill you. Right. And so, I mean, are these? Do you think these people are? Do you think that they're aware of what's happening, or do you think that they're more? Um, do you think that they're more like it's it's their delusional like is in about their project being the be all and end all and the bee's knees and whatever. yeah and and it's it's okay you know for, for people to be delusional <laughs> it's very common when people have a startup but one thing that's become abundantly clear since working in the space is that people do not do market research before they come to market with their idea they they never validate their ideas um they always think we're the first person to do this and then i'm like no you're not because this company this company and this company are doing the same thing and they don't even know who these companies are and that just shows that a lot of these people are you know opportunistic they think they have a great idea and they do but they're not the only one to have it and that doesn't mean to say you shouldn't pursue your idea but it's just very it's a bad sign if people aren't if they don't have their pulse on competition. Mm. But do you, but so I oh, so you think it's more of a, I mean, do you think that is the reason for that? I mean, like my view of it was always, you know, even when I was doing stuff in, in Dubai and Singapore was um, it's because the access to capital is just so 
you know, it, it's just so easy. You don't need to, in the traditional startup space, you'd normally have to go through an incubator or an accelerator program or pitch to a VC. And all those questions that you're mentioning there, I mean, they're all asked in that. I mean, like every VC is going to ask you, what's your, you know, what's your, you know, um, who's your market? Is there a market? Who are the people involved? Tell me about the team, blah, blah, blah. Whereas in the crypto space, traditionally, I mean, those questions are very seldom asked. You're not getting asked. <laughs> you know, people yeah. aren't going to ask you like whatever. They, and the people, I mean, like in 2017, like people didn't even understand what token economics was. It was just, it was just, what are you doing? All right. Yeah. Okay. Is it like blockchain? Oh, you know, we're going to be the Amazon. I mean, I remember I was uh, with some guys, um, the boys from Crypto Council, and we were getting pitched by a guy and he basically was just saying, oh, we're going to be the Amazon of blockchain. It's like, what? Well, how does that work? Amazon's already got that market. <laughs> now we're going to be bigger. Why? Yeah. Oh, we just are. It's like, well, okay, yeah. how? And now, it's oh, different now, of course. I mean, most of the biggest VCs in the space have either completely closed business or they've, you know, stripped back their numbers by 75%, they deploy 75% less capital because they were buying, uh, you know, so bullishly, like you just said, because someone would come along and say, we're the XYZ of blockchain and we're going to do this and we'll, it will be 100x. And, you know, funds were throwing loads of money in because in 2017 and 2018, they were doing a 10 to 100x. I mean, one chain, Icon, Ion, they all did, you know, outrageous returns. So all, all these funds had all this money. And then they're investing really aggressively. And then suddenly, you know, we hit the, the bear market and they just lost so much capital. And I've seen some of the biggest funds mm. in the world just close their doors because they didn't understand token economics. They just did well on a bull run and it was very easy to. And then on the way down, yeah. they just got so burned, uh, which is a good thing yeah. because because now the investors are asking the right questions. Like you said, you know, they are asking for validation and competition and, you know, what sets them apart. And even now people are, people want to see tangible real world business models rather than just, you know, blockchain business models because you need both. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the biggest issue is that people are still, um, I mean, it was, I th oh, sorry, the biggest issue back then was just the ease of getting capital. You didn't need to put in that work. There was no exactly. competition. You're essentially you're not competing against anybody from that investment capital because there was just so much of it. Um, you know, it was, it was, I remember late 2017, even early 2018, um, you know, filling a, filling a subscription for a $20 million raise. It was, was so easy. Yeah, it was minutes. Um, I mean, in some cases less. So, um, I mean, when you, when there is, there is no restriction or there's no even, you know, competitive reason to put in work, people will always choose the path of least resistance, Absolutely. which is always going to be put together a nice white paper. You know, <laughs> I, I remember say, there, was yeah. some, there were some dudes that were, I remember I met some guys who a few times that were charging 20,000 US to write a white paper. Well, and I mean, I won't lie to you. you know, I I help people write white papers for for you know, and I charged a fair bit of money because I knew what worked. I knew what raised money, and yeah. and you know, we both we were in the investment space, and we knew what worked. And unfortunately, for a lot of our clients, it did work. Um, but yeah, it was you know, even I I will put my hands up and and say that you know I got um, kind of misled by myself into uh, thinking that. You know, I was <laughs> solving the world's problems with blockchain, but when when you you know take a big step back and you realize that this is just a new technology layer that will sit on existing technology, and you know the the rampant bull runs over, you really start to see things in a different perspective. And um, I'm glad that I went through that. It was a really good learning curve, and um, you know I hope that a lot of these new companies now have learned from you know, the previous problems uh, that, that were, you know, evidently shown to us in the, in the bear market. What do you think is the, uh, is the best lesson you've learned from, uh, from being involved in that space? That the um, one? Well, I'd say uh, it, it's the market validation and market research. Um, I've, I think that that is absolutely essential to me so and to, to anyone. So basically saying that will this product ever have it serve a market basically 
yeah i'm validating your ideas with people in that in that you know in that space um it's it, it, it you know people talk about use case adoption use case adoption all the time mm. but you know they are they're very different things and you know adoption will happen naturally anyway and most of the people who talk about adoption won't be the ones to build tools for the world to use um it will be obviously a very few select handful of people but um yeah i think that that whole validation and and actually re researching and understanding your idea and your competition and people who can help streamline your process because if you don't know the space if you don't have your finger on the pulse of the market then you're going to overlook things which could you know 10x your production speed so actually going to market could be 10 times faster if you build on someone else's existing tech but if you don't know it exists you're going to try and build it from scratch and you're building the same thing as you know some other guy yeah and, and it's just it's all fragmented so i think you know the the best thing the best lesson that the bull market the bear market taught us was um that you know people can actually everyone was siloed because of the capital flow everyone was in these separate silos and they weren't communicating because they knew we can raise 20 million and we can build it better than they can but during the bear market people realized mm. they have to collaborate and that they should be collaborating because it will speed everything up yeah and then obviously after, but i think the reason why was because like you, like you said it was mostly because of the capital flow that if you could say you were going to be you were going to be the ethereum is in like all smart co co all smart contracts are going to be built on your network not ethereum's that would have attracted a you would have been able to raise 100 million dollars for that absolutely yeah and, and you would have been able to have the best lobster parties and part it was the were all the we parties had, down in yeah. um, puerto rico yeah puerto rico uh was was always fun miami blockchain miami in 2018 january oh my goodness that was something else you could see that people had made a lot of money um and then 2019 you could see it's all gone which was really interesting do you know what's happened to all these projects now the guys who have sort of put put large amounts of money in and then you know or have raised large amounts of money are they are they still active or are the projects still being built what's happening there yeah well unfortunately for a lot of them a lot of the big ones which raised you know 20 30 million they didn't have good treasury management so they were holding bitcoin and ethereum thinking it's going to go up forever and it so went the down holding bitcoin and ethereum at fifteen thousand plus and a thousand plus yeah and and now you know obviously they a lot of companies sold on the way down so they had a staggered sale, sales process where they would you know sell 25 percent at 700 bucks and then it got to 150 and people were selling ethereum at 150 bucks and if you think you raise 20 30 million and you have a roadmap and you're, we're going to do this by then uh, that 30 million isn't 30 million unless it's in usd and yeah. you actually have a budget for it and uh, you know it's outrageous how many teams didn't have a budget or treasury management so the ones that did and the ones that was smart with that uh you know hopefully are still building i know a few of them are doing very well uh still building away but um yeah it's it's really remarkable how many of the biggest projects on the market that everyone was super bullish about just hemorrhaged cash for the entire duration of 2018 and mm. some of them 2019 as well because mm. i was going to say that would have been the biggest thing um um i think that would have been the biggest thing as well would have been that just so many so many projects would have just yeah they would have raised on market highs and then not been um liquid enough they would not have been agile enough to really make a to make a solid um to make a solid move and i'd probably also say this is the the other thing is there is a significant portion of the market who are um like financially inexperienced like a lot of these dudes that were raising projects were 23 year old kids who had a computer science degree from xyz yeah. but then had no real world business experience no real you know financial management experience and then and they're managing 20 30 million dollar projects and of course, Absolutely. you know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying that, you know, they, they may have been incredibly talented. I'm not taking that away from them. But I'm saying that um, anyone in that, even if you're a seasoned finance manager, uh, over that time period where Ethereum's jumping from 1,000 to 1,500 and then, 
you know, within a within a month or two was down to under five hundred dollars. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, you know, with such a heavy technical space, you had a lot of very technical founders who don't know how to run a business, like you said, and, um, it, it starts well for development and that's how they get their, you know, POC out and they show people, you know, oh, this is what I can build. But if you don't have experienced business managers and, you know, financial managers, you just get crumbled by the market. And there's, you know, there's a lot of pressure as well in holding that much, uh, you know, in volatile assets. If you're holding, <laughs> you know, millions of dollars worth of ETH and you're bullish on ETH, your whole judgment for your whole business is clouded by your mm. own bias. And, it, you know, there's also the risk of, you know, having to handle the private keys. And I think a lot of people didn't well, realize yeah, like that. Canadian exchange. Um, yeah, yeah, mm. exactly. And a, a lot of people didn't realize that some of the some of the most high prospect teams in the world didn't have an office. They had a website, they had a white paper and they had a, a an ICO address. Hmm. And and they didn't have an office, and a lot of them still don't. It's it's crazy, and they raised off the back of the FOMO, um, and people trusted that it would do well because sharding or you know blockchain two point high transactions per second. Look at the team; they're from they're from here, they're from here, and a lot of these teams I spoke to, it, they had twelve people on their website, and you know only four of them actually worked for the business and the other the, the other guys didn't even work for the business they just agreed to be on the website to help them raise money well i know that there was some there were some dudes who were charging um upwards of 20k mm -hmm. to be or 20k to 50k to be a face on a website yeah uh, I'm, not, I'm not naming <laughs> gig, names. Right? and and this and when i say this name i'm not saying that he ever did this but it would be the kind of thing where you're like oh i want tim draper um, I, I think Tim Draper would do something like this, but it'd be like, oh, I want Tim Draper on my thing. Oh, yeah, sure, 50K. And, yeah, and Tim absolutely. Would be there. Um, and look, everyone has, everyone at some point, or most people, I say everyone, probably not everyone, most people have a budget for, 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 for being that guy. You know, if yeah. you say, look, we'll pay you 100 grand to advise us, and you don't really need to advise us that much, th the guys are going to take it. So it did work, and it worked well. But, um, but it, you know, th there, was, there was this whole underbelly, um where you know if you understood what was going on it was it was really messed up um and it was very obvious as well once you start to work with the teams and 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 understand how they operate it, you were like damn people are you know people are in trouble here and i've always been quite vocal about the teams that i i felt were you know kind of pulling the wool over people's eyes or i was always very vocal um because and the exchanges too. I mean, mm. you know, you know how exchanges work. It's just as bad, if not worse, really. Well, I mean, that was where the um, the IEO drama started because they were essentially the ones who were, um, you know, in many cases, that's where that's where the all the in in my mind anyway, that's where I think a lot of the exchanges were. Um, you know, that's where a lot of the falsifying of liquidity came from. Because it's like, well, if you want to, if you want to be part of my, you know, if you want to raise an IEO on my exchange. Um, you know, you need to pay this uh, ridiculous fee. Um, but, you know, as you can see here, we've got volume of X. Um, mm -hmm. Because up until that point, there was no reason why an exchange would ever need to falsify the amount of uh, liquidity they were doing. It was essentially, yeah. um, it would have been just absolutely ridiculous for them to to sort of, you know, you know, falsify the amount that they were doing. So... Yeah, and that same note, I mean, I think that that's why the exchange, I mean, the exchange is yet again, like any business, still driven by money. Um, they might talk about, you know, freeing um, freeing us from, you know, our, our, our current <laughs> financial overlords. Uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, yeah, the new ones. well, I mean, like, you know, if Binance really believed that, they wouldn't charge $5 million to list your ICO. Mm, um, indeed. So, I mean, like, you know, that's that's part of it. <laughs> But and I, I do think there's you know I mean there's obviously there's a, a bit of the um, um, there's a bit of the the Robin Hood style like you know we're going to take it you know we're going to fight back against the financial markets there but um, it's um, yeah I think that, that yeah I think that one of the major reasons why we had such high incidence of frauds on the exchange space um, is simply because so many um, exchanges are competing for that IEO money. 
Um, Absolutely. And, and they were trying to, you know, keep hold of that tailwind from the ICO bubble because mm. they realized that, hang on, if we do the ICOs on our, uh, and I saw this coming, I saw the IEO thing coming because um, one of the projects I was previously working with, um, you know, that their whole kind of, you know, selling point was we're going to build a platform to list ICOs on that will be highly secure, very user friendly. I, I do a, remember that project. <laughs> yeah, it didn't, didn't go to plan. Uh, but, uh, you know, th that was that was the idea. And then they had this big, big pivot and, and I left the business and such. But that was before the IEO bubble. And, um, you know, I did see that happening because people see the safety and the security in the exchanges, especially the big ones. Mm -hmm. So they kind of they were able to carry that tailwind. But that's a good segue to, you know, decentralized exchanges and decentralized offerings like mm -hmm. um, like DAOs, you know, continuous ICO offerings, um, because that is really where I see things going and why I like the the DeFi direction towards, you know, having DAOs and having continuous token offerings um, and having the ability for the token investors to kind of control the DAO and say, you know, you guys have, you know, you've done a terrible job. We want to cancel the next batch of funding, which is in the DAO. So mm. that's a really smart way that, you know, we can kind of take back control in this funding process well, that's what wanted that's what um uh, vitalik sort of originally said I, I remember it was during 2000 and it was like early 2018 late 2017 he said we need a, a, a dico where mm -hmm. basically you would have your your funds would only be received in tranches depending yep. on performance of the project like, like okay well you know I, I you know the project raises 10 million the founders spend their first million on you know, a lobster champagne soiree in in uh, in Puerto Rico, and then the investors go, well, maybe man, maybe we shouldn't give them the other seven. Um, yeah, exactly. And so, so I think that was, I mean, that was a good idea. I mean, it was obviously it was a bit clunky in the way that it was originally envisioned, but I think that, um, I mean, as a starting point, I mean, I think it was what was necessary. The most unfortunate thing was that it wasn't really picked up by the market and. I mean, it was picked up by a few projects, went out there and said, we're going to be the first DAICO and all this stuff. But I think the biggest issue at the time was investor education. And then, it, I mean, that was irrelevant for most Absolutely. investors. And um, that's why IEO is so attractive to people because they already have a Binance account or a KuCoin account or whatever, and they could just log in and send their Bitcoin there and, and, and it's done. They don't have to educate themselves. And that's why the DAO space, you know, is actually getting to that point now where I think it's fairly easy to use an Aragon, for example, um, you know, is, is a very nice uh, user interface and people soon will be able to do these DICOs. But is the liquidity there? Is there enough people who have the education? That's really the question. So it's well, always good to educate people about these things. Yeah, but that's still the biggest issue in the, in the area is that, I mean, I think that there's, it's the same issue with opinions on the internet is that there's just too much of it. And I think that if you, if you have a look at, you know, I remember the first time I learned about blockchain in 2016, when I first asked about it, I mean, like my, the explanation I got was completely like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, when someone tells you something like that doesn't exactly make sense, so I'm just going to discount the whole thing. Um, that's sort of what I was getting. And I, I still see today even the, the explanations that people give are not concise. I mean, like, you know, if you sort of, uh, unless you're a child, if you ask someone scientifically why the sky is blue, you will get a very consistent answer. Whereas mm. if you ask someone even today how blockchain works, it's still like, it's still it's very... very it's still very airy fairy, and there's a, still a lot of buzzwords floating around that 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 maybe aren't necessarily needed when making those explanations. Absolutely. Um, so I think that I mean I think yeah, education is the one biggest thing. But I mean I think that's the biggest issue when you have an industry run by um, marketers and tech people, and then there's not much in the middle. Um, Absolutely. Uh, but you, you get all the nice buzzwords and you get all the nice tech stuff, but then you don't get anyone in the middle to explain how the how the thing works. How it actually works. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, on the other side of the coin is we don't really need, people don't really need to understand what blockchain really is or what it does. No, and it's only that people don't need to understand how Wi-Fi works. Exactly, yeah. It does. But yeah. In, same, in that same breath, I'd probably say that people still, as a function of, of from a user standpoint, still don't understand where yeah. 
where blockchain is actually to be used, which is absolutely yeah. probably something still half the industry is still working out. Um, and, and that's why I am so bullish on these, you know, what I would view as kind of a layer two uh, DAP, which makes the layer one stuff more easy, you know, by attaching a password to a private key or, you know, uh, it, making seed phrase easier. It, these are things which kind of move us to the next stage where you yeah, can actually use user experience easier. Because mm -hmm. at the moment, the user experience is, is it's horrible. So you've got um, obviously what you're doing with Zumo. Um, I know that you run a very, very prestigious um, Telegram channel full of a lot of crypto experts. Uh, and then you obviously are doing the stuff with the startup. So what else is keeping Charlie busy lately? Well, baby on the way in 10 days, which is, uh, which is uh, you know, exciting. Um, I'm in Switzerland right now. I'm just waiting for this to all blow over. Um, you know, oh, you mean world... Corona? Sorry, say again? Corona, you mean? Or... Yeah. Corona, yeah. indeed. Uh, no, <laughs> I don't think that blows over anytime soon. Um, so, so yeah, you know, staying here, my girlfriend's Swiss, so it, it's um, it's a it's a much safer place to be. Healthcare's mm. good here, and um, you know, it, I'm very comfortable. So, just enjoying some time in uh, in Switzerland. The weather's nice, and um, you know, just I've been writing a lot as well. I've been doing a lot of research on stable coins and um you know monetary experiments in general and funny enough what we were just talking about cryptocurrency is money and um how it can be used for remittance and payments and that's why i'm really excited about zumo because it, you know it's a very simple user interface that pretty much anyone can understand and they can use it to send money across the world um and that's ultimately what we need to make that you know sending of cryptocurrency easy so um yeah, uh, it's, it's been really busy. I'm working on a few things. I, I like to work on a few things because Ooh. that's how I keep my finger on the pulse of the market and how I understand, you know, competitors, um, who's doing what, you know, what the newest projects are. And the best way to do that is to kind of keep quite fluid uh, working schedule and and just you know read read as much as I can. So I'm following some really interesting projects at the moment. Um, and yeah, the Telegram community is doing well. It's picked up, which is nice. So I think people are feeling bullish again. Uh, I mean, that, that was what I always said in that group. It was like, if if the group's silent, there is nothing going on. Absolutely. And it was silent for a while, you know, and now it's picked up a lot. There's a uh, new interest in the group and, uh, you know, people are sharing ideas, which is always nice, sharing information and keeping each other informed which is ultimately what the group was made for uh for, yeah. for smart people to 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 do that so without shilling yeah i mean people do shill naturally you know if i'm bullish on something and i say it has 100x potentials because it might actually do i believe it might do um but you know i i i I say to everyone i'm never ever telling anyone what to buy because after after previous uh, endeavors in the crypto market you just have to be very careful with your own money and other people's it's more that it's more than and this is something i've learned from being in the financial services industry for a long time is um is you if you if you give tell someone what to buy if they make money it's because they're they're intelligent mm -hmm. um if they lose money it's your fault for giving bad advice yeah indeed you'll always get blamed if it goes bad and they'll always get the you know the credit when it goes well that's that's yeah. been my experience from many many years in the financial space and i get asked because we we run a bunch of um we run a bunch of different um stuff on crypto at the moment different seminars and things and i gotta say that it's sort of like that that age-old thing where it's like people always ask well you know what should we get into what are you thinking you know what's your advice i'm just like i'm not going to get roped into that there is no, no way chance. In there's no way in a million years I'm getting I'm touching it with a football. And then the yeah. other thing is, and I, I tell them honestly, I'm like, the reason is um, because if I get it right, it's because you're a genius. If I get it wrong, I've ripped you off. Yeah. And there's absolutely. no two ways about it. And I can't, My I can't still don't forgive it. me because I told them to buy ETH at a thousand, thousand bucks. Uh, and they still I, know, I, it. I, you know, I also told them to buy at 300 bucks and they didn't listen. So they FOMO'd in and it was their fault. Uh, so yeah. hopefully none of them are listening. But um, <laughs> but yeah, that, that's it's the thing. You, know, you tell people to buy something low and they buy it high and then you get the blame anyway. But it, it's, it's everyone's own responsibility to know when to um, 
you know yes. when they're, they're responsible for their own money so yeah but i try not to i don't shill things on twitter anymore um or at least i try not to um I'm, I've moved a lot more towards academia and education because ultimately I am very long-term bullish on the technology, whereas a lot of people said they were, but then when the price went down, they said it's all it's all going to zero, it's all a big scam. And that's when you should be bullish on price again, historically, well, is when yeah, everyone's when there's, bearish. When there's blood in the streets. Um, yeah. I think that there was a bit of that, but I think... Um, I mean, I think it would have been the time for, I mean, there would have been a lot of projects that would have got, been absolutely annihilated um, in in that time period. Um, and there would have been projects that would have been, that should have stayed annihilated. Um, and, and, and sorry, I'm just saying that if you would have bought anything um, during the bear market, you probably would still be down. Whereas obviously your good stuff, Bitcoin, blah, blah, blah. Um, obviously has been going uh, not too bad. So absolutely. Yeah. It's a bit of an interesting one but um and so yeah so what else um so you've got the kid um you've got uh which we've talked about a couple of times i'm sorry about that you the wallet oh and I, I, you did mention um security tokens what are your feelings on that at the moment um i think that that was another one of these kind of flavor of the month bubbles and mm -hmm. that the infrastructure is not in place for security token offerings and it won't be for a long time uh, I'm not bullish on security tokens like uh, some people are. I think it will be fantastic when it does work, but uh, you know the US is so far behind, and the infrastructure will have to be built there um, because that's ultimately you know where most of these securities um, are issued and and where people you know were most bullish. And I think, you know, think do you think necessarily from a do you think it's because of the capital raising perspective, or do you think the technology will not be uh, legally allowed? I think uh, uh, both, really. Oh, yeah. I think both. Um, the tech, the technology. I mean, eventually it will be allowed, but it will take a lot of lobbying. Um, a lot of very intelligent lawyers will have to be behind that that effort as well. And the technology to actually build the infrastructure for security token exchanges is not going to exist. And that's because there's no liquidity. There, there's, there won't be demand to buy security. Oh, no, yeah, no, I know that. So, oh, no, so, no. So, so the slippage most, is... It's mostly going to be done through brokering because obviously the biggest yeah. issue is that, yeah, I mean, if you... if you The one argument I always use when I'm, when I'm out and about, and as you know, most of my work is Southeast Asia, um, you know, is if you're going to go buy... A t if you're going to go start an, an a STO that comprises of, tw let's say, 100 villas in Bali that are being used on Airbnb and there's going to be profit shared amongst token holders. Mm -hmm. um, how often are people really going to be buying and selling tokens in that asset? Because real mm -hmm. estate is a long-term game. Um, I mean, let's say you have, you know, a hundred properties and you have a thousand holders. Um, you know, how often are investors going to be turned over? 10% a year, which means you're going to be selling a hundred, you're going to be transacting a hundred tokens or a hundred investors are going to be transacting over the case of a exactly. year. That's, that's two, two a week, two sales exactly. a week um, and no market. No, there's no need for a 24 hour market if your liquidity is that low. Exactly. Uh, so no, yeah. I agree with you in that space, in that mm -hmm. sense. Um, I mean, I, I personally have a, a different view of the, I think that security tokens are something that is, that could be very, very useful um even in the scenario of oh um, i agree yeah. being able to do stuff like that but i think that i agree with you in the fact that the infrastructure isn't there and it can't be a copy paste of it's the going current to take a while. and it can't be a copy paste of the current infrastructure yeah it's got to be completely but different. Will, I'm, I'm very bullish long term on security tokens they offer a lot more um you know, feasible financial return and they make more sense. Um, they're, you know, they're, they'll be regulated and it will just be a much more airtight operation. That said, I still think that utility tokens would always have this place, um, you know, in the crypto market. Mm. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to watching that evolve as well. So, um, yeah, but I think security tokens are a long way off. And I saw people oh, trying yeah. to build STO exchanges and, 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 rebrand themselves from ICO advisor to STO advisor and uh, <laughs> I saw all the same things happening and you know it's actually I do believe it's uh, you know don't quote me on this but I do believe it's not actually legally advisable to to call yourself an STO advisor unless you're you know a licensed broker and mm. you, you're actually allowed to operate in that space and I was seeing yeah, all the issues such licenses 
Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, I was just seeing the same things happen again. And the the STO hype kind of died down as well. That was really a 2018 mm. thing. And, and that's died down. And, and it's, uh, you know, just one of them flavor of the month things for now. But I am looking forward to it long term. Yeah, I think there's a space for it. But I think that, yeah, a lot more work and probably a lot more investment on the infrastructure side needs to take place. Because sure. at the moment, it's just... It's just, yeah, it's just, like you said, it's just not there. Um, and so um, what are you seeing? Um, what are you seeing happening over the next, uh, what do you reckon other than um, the dramas with, um, you know, a certain global pandemic? I mean, how do you, what, what are you seeing for the rest of 2020? Well, I mean, it's so hard to predict given that, um, you know, the market's up despite the worst pandemic in 100 years and the worst uh, unemployment <laughs> in 100 years, yet the mar market's still rallying, you know, Monday morning today and the uh, market's still up. It's, it's, it's yeah, insane. I haven't, I haven't seen the chart. I haven't actually looked at the chart. Uh, yeah, even Bitcoin. I actually took a small Bitcoin short last night thinking that the markets might react this morning to uh you know the incredible riots taking place but it, bitcoin held nine five when i woke up so i just uh you mm, know i got stopped okay. out and um yeah so i mean look i think that for the crypto space things are moving forward uh in the right direction um there's a lot of bridges being built between protocols that will make things easier um for example you know cava on cosmos and then you have um you know zip by outlier ventures which is you know streamlining the ability to build on multiple protocols at once without actually holding any tokens which is you know very smart and i think things like that will encourage a new wave of developers to come in and then hope for hopefully we can start building some applications that normal people can understand and benefit from um so i'm i'm you know i'm very bullish on the next few years i also think you know we're, we're coming to the next stage in the cycle unless the global markets do crash which they probably should at some point but who knows then um it's a hard look. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, I'm, I've been, I've been more on the on the bearish side after all this. I'm like, well, we've 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 all caught the we've all caught the cold, but we haven't got the symptoms yet. Mm. Because obviously, anything anything financial is going to take a while to weed through, um, mm. as businesses fail and they don't start back up again. And then all that needs to happen is that sentiment and that positivity just needs to just needs to get beat down, and then Which we go will. into despair. And then when despair kicks in, I mean, that's when everything drops. And then when it's absolute despair is when you start buying again. Um, yeah. And the, the unfortunate thing is I'm still seeing people positive, maybe not in certain cities and cities in the States at the moment. But, um, but I mean, as, a, as an idea of a market, people are even in Australia, they're just like, oh, no, no, it's not too bad. We, we'll be yeah. back in business in a few months. Um, you know, you, and, and people are more concerned here about when they can go on their next holiday yeah. in Bali. Absolutely, um, yeah. Which and I the correlation is still there with 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 Bitcoin and the legacy markets. So if the legacy markets do go down, you know, crypto is not gonna probably not gonna hold until there is that decoupling. So I'm kind of hoping we do see that. Um, but you know, on the Black Thursday crash, that coincided perfectly with um, you know legacy market drop. And you you know, the, the um, 13th of march or sorry of uh, april or? yeah yeah when um, that, was, that was that was only because of um that that all happened because the who can declared that this was a global pandemic i mean yeah, that was very it, it, but, but bitcoin about. you know bitcoin directly correlated with that with yes. yeah yes. But and has, that's, that's that's what i'm worried about if if things do go downhill soon that everyone's super bullish on crypto still um, but it still shows a lot of signs of being, you know, directly correlated to. Oh, but I think but if you have a look at the recovery since, I mean, like the Dow Jones um, and the S and P five hundred has done not much since. Sure. Um, I mean, like you know, they've had a slight recovery since their lows, but I mean, Bitcoin's up for the year. Um, Bitcoin's doing very well. Yeah. 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 Bitcoin's up for the year. DJ's still down thirteen percent for the year. So. Um, and I oh, actually the last thing the last thing I want to talk to you about. Well, this is a good segue into that. Is did you read the um, the Goldman Sachs report? I didn't. No, I heard about it, but I tend not to um, pay much attention because <laughs> historically, it's a, uh, it's a good one. That's a good one. It's got no, but I mean, I think that that, that the I think the reaction from the the crypto space about it is maybe a bit. It's a bit without empathy, mm. like. You know, it's sort of like if you, and I'm sure you've met guys in your travels, you know, who work for these investment banks, um, 
you know, they're not, I mean, like, you know, I, I don't believe that there's this global conspiracy that, that JP Morgan and all these guys are trying to do play funny games to um, accumulate low, <laughs> to accumulate low on Bitcoin and stuff. I mean, the thing is that they're not like when you get an organization that big, there's there's no agility. Um, and if, if you're going to do clandestine things, you need to be agile. Absolutely. And you know, I mean, like they employ tens of thousands of people. There's no such thing as a conspiracy in an organization that big. Yeah, it's bureaucratic red red tape everywhere. Well, it's it's okay. Put it this way: if you're gonna if your clients were mostly high net worth retirees or whatever. Uh, or people with loads of money, would you be saying to them, yeah, get into Bitcoin? <laughs> I mean, like your prop desk or your guys who are doing prop trading or something, you can, if they're just like, yeah, boys, look, you know, we're going to, we're going to make some money on Bitcoin this week. You're going to tell them, go ahead. Like the bank, oh, you know, the, the, the investor, the bank isn't going to care. They're going to be like, yeah, go ahead. You know, whatever's going to make us money in the same way that um, Enron, mm -hmm. even when they found out that their traders were skimming money off the top, they sent them letters saying, we don't care, keep going, boys, because they were just making them money. They didn't give a shit. And I think in the same note, I mean, you know, if Goldman is doing stuff in Bitcoin or in crypto off their own books, that's fine, but they're never going to advise their customers yeah, to get absolutely. involved in this exactly. space and the, and the reasons they list. I mean, it's a 30-page it's a, it's, it's a PowerPoint presentation, so there's nothing to it. Um, but if you actually read it and you're like, all right, the reasoning, the reasoning makes sense, you know what I mean? Like... This this actually is something that is um is worth looking at. Uh, also, it's like you like if if I was if I was you know advising you know retirees and their four hundred one k and high net worth and blah blah blah. I mean, I'd be saying the same thing. I'd be like, yeah, yeah probably absolutely. crypto isn't for you right now. It um, is interesting to see them acknowledge it as well. Uh, um, but, you know, yes, yeah, five impact five on five slides. Five slides. Yeah. Yeah, that that's that's really you know that's really big, and and to say uh, you know the impact on commodities and and uh, and Bitcoin, you know, to have it named in in the title like that is is very interesting. So you know, I didn't read it, uh, maybe I should, but um, I, I I I read a lot of takes on it from <laughs> from takes, uh, if, if, if you if you go in with well, what I did was I I, I saw the same takes. But I, I went in with a bit of an open mind and just said, "All right, sure. well, where's this going?" Um, and uh, and and yeah, my view was that it was, you know, it was like if it was if it was an investment advisory firm sending out advice to their customers. And you think about who a Goldman customer is; it's not going to be a, a twenty-three-year-old kid working McDonald's. Um, you know, the advice was fairly reasonable. If you had a look at it as in that, if it was like a um, what's uh, what's the big VC block uh, block capital block one it, the EOS one yeah yeah block block on block one uh, if it was if it was um, one of like one of those guys putting out a report that looked like that you might be a bit shitty but mm -hmm. we're not talking you know the different customers and different messages and things so it was a bit I thought it was a bit uh, I thought it was a bit a bit silly but yeah, um indeed. yeah but um yeah i mean um i mean i've taken now um um I've taken up a bit of your time now man it's been just over an hour um yes. time but, flies um, yeah i know when you're having fun um but uh, yeah <laughs> is there any, anything else that you've been um that you've been you've been having uh, any experiences you've had in the past couple of weeks or the past month or so that has been mildly interesting um well i mean it marked a year since the um since the consensus event that was a web event this year which was mm -hmm. interesting and i want to you know encourage anyone who's listening to to try and attend them because most of the events now are free whereas you'd pay 200 to a thousand dollars for a ticket if you were going to actually attend in person plus your flight plus your travel expenses and such so i'd really encourage people to, to check them out because they are they're very good and you can request meetings directly with founders and 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 um and and you know project uh, project owners and most of the time they'll they'll talk to you because you know that they, they um they wanted to be at the conference and they wanted to have this networking opportunity and opportunity to kind of you know tell you about what they're building so mm -hmm. i did that and then diffusion devcon which is outlier ventures um you know they they do a devcon as well which brings together some of the best teams in the space and they had a really interesting day last thursday which was just packed back to back with some of the best panels i've ever seen um the, you know people from r3 labs and then shell shell blockchain team 
and then they had you know agoric um uh, a bunch of teams were were there and some really good panels so so yeah i'd encourage people to kind of keep an eye on that because there's lots of good web events um we are going to do one for zumo soon which i'll you know follow up with more yeah, info send on. me the um send me the detail yeah and that should have some good panelists and uh you know we're gonna have you got just... that have you got the dates for that sorted and the details for that sorted uh not 100 percent. i don't want to announce too much but it will be at the start of july which is okay. uh, not too far um and we're trying to do that time so all time zones can kind of come which will be you know which will be uh ideal so yeah i think you know it, it now's a really good time to be um to continue networking web-based networking and uh and and to definitely just keep learning and reading and talking to smart folks because mm -hmm. there's a lot of us and everyone's stuck at home right now and it's much easier to get people on the phone <laughs> when they're stuck at home and not traveling so uh well, yeah that's always been yeah my biggest problem yeah but anyway these things happen yeah, but um question. but look um charlie's been good um i'll try to we'll try to have another catch-up chat hopefully i can um i can make it a bit more a bit more direct and we can get go through some specifics about your um your recent experiences um cool. but today was just more of a chinwag just to see how things are going but um catch up. yeah it's been a, it's been a while, eh? yeah exactly but i'll um i'll have this out probably in a couple of days cool uh, probably by friday um but then i want to i want to sort of um because what i want to cover when we chat again is maybe i want to chat about your experiences of um working in dubai um sure. and, then, and then just that whole era i want to i want to get Charlie Reed from 2017 and 18 and get all the uh get all the highlights because I know that well I know if your <laughs> if your period was anything like mine it would have been fantastic yeah but, we um, had a lot of fun eh? no I'd love to talk again just uh just ping me you know I'm open in 10 days I'll be a little bit preoccupied <laughs> yes I, well, <laughs> but, probably, um, I've, managed, I've managed a couple of days you know you want to give it a couple of days here or there yeah but, um, yeah and no, I appreciate it all right mate but, well yeah. look um have a great day. I know it's um, just starting your morning there now. Whereas here it's now nine o'clock at night. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, we'll catch up soon. Absolutely. Thanks, man. Take care. No, dude. Have a good one. See ya. Bye.